So today, our last lecture on machine learning, we're going to look at decision trees and neural nets. We're also going to look at a little bit of um, learning theory, and that's what we'll kick it off with. So formalizing learning. Um, let's think of learning as, let's say in the context of writing some experiments and you try to recover some relationship between some variables. So you run some experiments, mix some things, try to predict what will happen, try to find an underlying law that explains the results of your experiments. Um, so the way we'll think of it is as follows. Let's say there is some target function g. Whoa. Let's say there is some target function g. And that target function is what we're trying to recover, but you don't know what it is. As you're doing your machine learning, what you get for training data is pairs, x and g of x. For example, x could be the email, g of x could be the classification spam versus ham. Um, x could be a house, g of x could be the price of that house. The problem we try to solve is this one here. Um, Effectively, we have some hypothesis space, and that's kind of the learning theory view of what we're doing, capital H, and think of it as a set of things, and each element in that set is a hypothesis. Each hypothesis is a function that takes an input, x, and maps it to some predicted, let's say, price for a house, or if it's the email problem, spam versus ham. And the problem we're trying to solve here is find the best H in that set capital H in terms of the one that's as close as possible to G. We've been doing that in different ways, right? We've been doing that in the context of classification for, um, let's say, Naive Bayes that did it for us, Perceptron did it for us. It would find some function H. I'm not sure where these things come from. Um, so, Perceptron would say, we consider all linear classification boundaries, which define a function from the input to an output, positive or negative class. Of all the ones that we have available, we try to find the one that's closest to the true classification that we try to make. And the way we've done this is by looking at training examples, and we've looked at, can we find one that does really well on the training examples? If it does, um, then maybe it's also close to the true hypothesis G that we're trying to recover. All we can really base this on is the training examples and then also um, the cross-validation data. So for Perceptron, we have H of X is of the form W transpose phi of X. And so choices of W index into our set capital H, that's Perceptron. For naive Bayes, we have a base net, and the conditional probabilities here, probability for feature i given classification label y, are the parameters that we get to choose, as well as distribution for y as a prior. All these are things we get to choose. A choice of all those conditional probabilities together is one hypothesis. <laughs> And so we have infinitely many of those, and we somehow recover one of them. In Naive Bayes, we recovered it by fitting the counts of the training data, maybe with some smoothing, um, not by directly optimizing the classification error. Okay, but so keep this picture in mind. And one thing to realize is that sometimes G, the thing you really are supposed to recover, if you were to do it the best possible, might not be in your set capital H. Your set capital H might be smaller and not contain G. And then you hope to find the closest one over here. Okay, so let's look at a regression example. Here we have x on the horizontal axis and the function f of x shown on the vertical axis. We get to see, in this case, six training examples. And maybe our hypothesis space consists of functions that can map from x to a value. And maybe then this could be a reasonable guess of what we want. Um, if we restrict ourselves to lines, this might be the best one. If we're willing to do something more complicated, maybe a parabola, this might be the best one. If we want to do something even more complicated, we could go through all the points, or we could go through all the points in this way. 
So there are many hypotheses here. Some of them are more consistent with the training data than others. And the kind of interesting thing to note here is that consistency with the training data is not the only thing we might care about. You might care about other properties, let's say being a simple function like a line, because you might think that using a line going through most of the data points might allow you to generalize better than a very complicated function going through all the data points. All right, so the trade-off here is one between consistency, and consistency refers here to picking a hypothesis as consistent as possible with the training data, and simplicity, which is restricting yourself to a very simple hypothesis. A pretty kind of well-known paradigm here is the Occam's razor idea, and the idea there is that of all hypotheses that are consistent with your training data, pick the simplest one. Of course, this requires some notion of simple, there's nobody, why, why would a line be simpler than a parabola? That's pretty subjective, but if you have some notion of simple that you are happy to go with, pick the simplest one consistent with your data. So there's a pretty fundamental trade-off here. In statistics, rather than calling it consistency versus simplicity, maybe you might call it bias versus variance. You have a set of hypotheses, and let's say you're considering two different hypothesis sets, H1 and H2 you wonder which one should we be using, maybe H1 is um, about this large, H2 is larger and comprises all of H1. Then if you restrict yourself to H1, you might end up with a high bias if let's say your thing G is over here because you are pretty far away from being able to achieve G. If you were willing to use all hypotheses in H2, you might have a lower bias because you could end up closer to G. On the flip side, if you have a small amount of training data and you somehow find the best hypothesis in your set H1 based on that training data, um, you might find pretty consistently the same hypothesis H inside H1, whereas if you use H2, which is much larger, you have a very high variance in terms of what hypothesis H gets selected as, as to be the one that fits your training data best. So the larger your hypothesis class, the more variance you'll have in terms of which hypothesis you end up retrieving. Usually, algorithms are set up to minimize, to minimize training error, that is, be maximally consistent. And so you need an external mechanism to ensure that you are um, keeping it simple. So, in some sense, consistency is by default for most algorithms. And what we need to do to keep it simple is somehow enforce that explicitly. And there are two ways we've seen of how we can do that. The first one is to reduce the hypothesis space, which corresponds to this picture over here. You might prefer H1 as your hypothesis space over H2 to keep things simpler. Only allow for lines, not more complicated function fits and so forth. Um, another way to keep it simple is in naive Bayes. You have a Bayes net that looks like this. That's a Bayes net over four variables, making a lot of independence assumptions. So you're restricting the expressiveness of the distribution you're learning by only have a, having a small number of edges here. You could imagine learning a Bayes net that's more complicated, for example, one that looks like this, and then you would have a richer hypothesis class, and you might be more prone to overfitting. In terms of features, you might apply feature selection. The idea here is that as you learn your classifier, maybe using Naive Bayes or using Perceptron, you allow for only a certain number of features. Let's say you allow for only one feature. You might look at all your features, learn your perceptron based on just one feature, so you've got 100 features total, only use one at a time. You learn 100 perceptron classifiers, see which one does best, and now that's your best one within the hypothesis class of being allowed to only use one feature. You might do the same thing for two features, three features, and so forth. So that's a way to keep it simple. You reduce the number of features, that way you have less parameters you're estimating from your data. We'll see another example in lecture today that involves uh, decision trees. And the whole other way to regularize is to do it through, in some sense, keeping yourself away from the most extreme hypotheses in your learning space. So when you run Perceptron, you might apply early stopping. What that means is that you're building up your weight vector W, but at some point you decide to stop adding to W, you say I'm stopping with my learning, 
What that means is that you're keeping yourself away from very extreme vectors w, and that's a way of regularizing. Um, other ways to do it, we'll see today in decision trees where you might cut off branches of the tree to stay away from very detailed models that might be overfitting to the data. In naive base, we did it by smoothing out. We wouldn't allow zero, one as probabilities. We would smooth the counts to stay away from those extreme hypotheses. All right, so that's a little bit of a high level context of how learning happens. Let's now take a look at decision trees, which is, you know, in some sense parallel to we've seen naive Bayes, we've seen perceptron. Here is another approach, decision trees. As a reminder, here's what our data could look like. What kind of problem are we looking at? Let's say you're running a restaurant and you're curious to dis, uh, as to whether a potential customer would be willing to stick around and wait if you tell them it's gonna be a 10 minute wait, a 30 minute wait, or they might disappear. And you collect some data on that. So you have, um, here we have whether there's a bar in your restaurant, whether it's Friday or not, whether it's, uh, whether the customer looks pretty hungry or not, um, how many patrons you already have, does your restaurant look full or empty, um, the price, whether it's raining or not, um, this one I'm blanking on, the type of restaurant, French, Thai, burger, Italian, and so forth, um, and the estimated waiting time. What we're trying to predict is whether they will wait or not, which is a true or false prediction. Okay, so the way decision trees would represent the hypothesis class, so the set of things you can represent is by um, trees. And the way these trees work is as follows. The root of the tree will have an attribute in it. In this case, patrons. How many patrons are there in the restaurant? None, some, or full. Depending on the value of that attribute, there's a split. In this case, if there are none, this decision tree will just say false. Like if your restaurant is empty and you make people wait, they're not going to wait. They're just going to disappear. If there are some, it's gonna say true. People are willing to wait. If it's full, then the next attribute considered is the wait estimate. How long would they have to wait? This can take on, in this case, four different values, bigger than 60, between 30 and 60, 10 to 30, and zero to 10. For zero to 10, for example, this decision tree will return true, willing to wait. For 10 to 30, there'll be a sub-decision tree here where there's a new attribute on which we split whether the customer is hungry or not, and so forth. So you get the picture, there's a procedure here that allows you to traverse this tree and to decide for any new customer, if you see all their attributes, that is all their features, you can decide whether they will wait or not according to this particular decision tree. In this case, what we encode at the bottom is true or false. That's a true truth table. Um, in general, you could encode other things with decision trees. You could encode conditional probability tables. So you could put probabilities at the bottom here. And then you'd be encoding a conditional probability table. For example, if there were a probability distribution here, that would be the conditional distribution given that the restaurant is full, the weight estimate is 30 to 60, there is no alternate restaurant, near, restaurant nearby, they have no reservation, and there is no bar. And then that would be the conditional based on all those features, taking on those values. What is the distribution here? You'd have some table sitting here, true, false, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, something like that. So sometimes actually people use these within BaseNets. If you have a BaseNet where a variable might have many, many parents, and representing a full table might be pretty expensive, you might put a decision tree inside your BaseNet, inside your conditional probability table, and then there would be conditional probabilities at the bottom. There can also be regression values. So if we go back to um, the plotting examples or the house prices example, you might have a real number sitting at the bottom that's your prediction for what the value should be if all these attributes stick on these particular values. If the true function is inside your big set, capital H, then we say um, it's realizable. So in terms of the picture we had in learning theory, if your G lies inside capital H, this is the realizable case. And if G were to lie outside of your capital H, then you have an unrealizable case. All right, so how expressive are decision trees? What can we represent with them? 
um, you can represent any function of the features that you're willing to consider. For example, you can represent an XOR. This is the tabular representation. And you can effectively just rebuild that table in the form of a decision tree, right? You just split on each feature that's available. So you split on each column in your table. Each level in the decision tree will correspond to one of the columns that you split on. And that way you can represent any tabular, to any table directly with the decision tree. Um, if you're going to do that, you're not going to benefit a whole lot from using a decision tree because it's just going to be just as expensive to represent as the table. Also, if you're doing learning, you allow for decision trees that can represent anything. It means you're using a very big um, hypothesis space and you might be very prone to overfitting. So in practice, you want to be careful about making them too expressive. Let's first compare this to perceptrons. So what could you represent with a perceptron? Well, let's say you had this restaurant example and your set of features. Your perceptron would represent the hypothesis class as W transpose phi of X. So effectively what you're able to do in a perceptron is for each feature, you're able to give a positive contribution or a negative contribution. And together they add up to a prediction that might be true or false. This is very different from decision trees. In decision trees, as you work through the branches in the tree, you're actually considering ends. You're considering if the first feature took on the value of the left branch, if the second feature took on the value of the right branch and so forth, then this is what I'm going to predict. So decision trees are more expressive than perceptrons because um, they can end together features. So how many different functions can we present with a decision tree? Let's say we have n Boolean attributes. So each of the n attributes can take on two values. How many, I think it's when it's touching my uh, sweater. Let's see. Not really. OK. How many decision trees can we represent over n Boolean attributes? Well, for every attribute, we could in principle make a split. That means we have two to the n possibilities, out outcomes, right? And then after we drew that tree, which has two to the n leaves, for each of those leaves, we can decide whether they're going to be true or false. So we have two to the n leaves, each of them a binary choice, so two to the two to the n um, possibilities. If you just had six Boolean attributes, that would mean you have the choice between um, million, billion, trillion, um, beyond 18 million trillion different trees just for six Boolean attributes. So this is, very this is a very large hypothesis space. You probably don't want to consider all of those if you only have a limited amount of training data. What if we limit our expressiveness? What if you just have one feature you're allowed to split on? You can choose any feature, but you can only use a feature and then you're done. These are decision stumps, depth one decision trees. Well, now um, you have n choices over features, so that makes for n different tree structures. Then each of them will have a split into two. So we'll have two leaves. So you have a total of n times two um, leaves. And then for each of the leaves, you can choose whether they're true or false. So in this case, we would have, if we had feature one, we split. This is based on feature one, this is based on feature two. And here we, get, had, we could have true or false, true or false. This is a total of four. Same thing here, four. So total we have n times four, four n decision stumps. So if we restrict ourselves to just decision stumps, we have a much smaller hypothesis space and maybe that'll work better in some scenarios. Okay, so overall, what's good about having a very expressive uh, hypothesis class is that you might be able to capture very complex patterns. What's bad about it is that you will be able to be consistent with the training data pretty much always if you have a very large hypothesis class and so you might end up overfitting. Um, so large hypothesis classes means lower bias, which is good, but higher variance, which is bad if you don't have a whole lot of training data. So here's an algorithm to learn the decision tree. 
you would start out with some examples, a set of attributes, and then some default tree that you might return. If your set of examples is empty, which is the base case, you return the default. There is nothing to be done there. Else, if all examples have the same classification, that you're con all examples you're considering have the same classification, that means you can just return the label for that set of examples and you're done. You don't need to branch any further. Um, so you just return that classification. If your attributes are empty, meaning you have done so many splits working down your way in the tree that no attributes are left to split on, well, then all you can do is look at your examples take the majority vote in terms of labels they have and return that as what you would return in that branch of the tree. The typical case would be that none of these base cases are true. You would choose your best attribute to split on. We'll see in the next slides how we might do that. Then you build a new tree rooted where you are right now, which will be a subtree for your bigger tree, and you rooted splitting on that best attribute. For each Example, you have your training set, you check which value it takes on for that best attribute, and then channel them into the right branch of the tree accordingly, and you recurse. So the big question here is, how do you choose an attribute that is the right one to split up? So here's an example. Let's say we right now are considering just the patrons, um, just decision stumps, so patrons here, type here. Um, the split on patrons leads to this decision stump. The split on type leads to this one here. Intuitively, the one that's better is the one that splits on patrons. Why? Because you get just negative here, just positive here, and then still a mix here, but at least not everything's in a mix. Whereas here, everything is just an equal mix, and that split is not telling you anything about how to predict whether customers will wait or not. So clearly, we would prefer the left split over the right split, but the question is how can we quantify this? If you're given a split, can you compute a number? And by looking at that number, you can then say that's the score, and the higher the score, the better the split, and that's what I'm going to go with. Okay, so to be able to introduce that score, we're going to make a little detour and look at a little bit of information theory, which is a huge discipline in and of itself. Uh, we'll just really barely touch on it, but we'll introduce the concept of entropy and information. So, the idea in information theory, or the part that we're looking at, is to look at if you have something you want to communicate, some information, how many bits does it take to get that piece of information across? And the assumption we're going to make is that ahead of time, we know a distribution over what it is that we might want to communicate. So, let's say there's a Boolean question, and the prior is that half the time the answer will be yes, half the time the answer will be no. And how many bits are needed on the average to answer this question? You need one bit. You need one bit because all you need to do is send a zero or one and that will encode the yes or no answer to the question. Now let's say there's a four-way question and the prior is that one-fourth of the time, each of the four answers will be the correct answer. How many bits do you need to communicate the answer? Let's say you ask the question, you know the answer. How many bits do you need on average? If you were asked the question many, many times, and of course the answer will change each time or could change each time, on the average, how many bits do you need to communicate the answer? Well, you need to distinguish between four possible outcomes. One bit can only distinguish between two, but with two bits you can distinguish between four outcomes. So if you use two bits, you use maybe zero, zero for the first one, zero, one for the next one, one, zero, and then one, one for the last one, you can communicate the answer. And so that's a scheme that allows you with two bits to communicate the answer. How about a question that has four possible answers, but the distribution is zero for the first answer, zero for the second answer, zero for the third one, and probability one for the last answer. How many bits do you need to communicate the answer here? I hear zero, and that's correct, because the answer is known ahead of time. The answer is the fourth thing, right? So you would use a different encoding here, extremely simple encoding where you communicate nothing. So even though in both cases we have four possible answers, 
The distribution is affecting how we encode the answers and how many bits we might use for each answer. How about a three-way question now, where we have probability one-half for the first thing to be the answer, one-fourth for the second thing, one-fourth for the third thing. How many bits do we need on the average to communicate the answer? See some twos. Let's think about this. What can we do in here, right? Um, three possible answers. Certainly one bit is not going to be enough because with one bit we can only distinguish between two things. Um, one thing we could do here is we could say, well, this is the most frequent answer. I'm going to use a one for that. And then these are less frequent, so I'm going to use zero, zero for this one, zero, one for that one. And so half the time we use one bit, one fourth of the time we, well, we use the zero, zero, which is two bits, and then another one fourth of the time we use two bits. This comes out to, on the average, let's see, um, three halves. So your average communication rate in terms of bits, in this case, for this particular encoding, would be on your average, you use one and a half bit per answer. You might say, well, this worked out pretty well, right? Because this was one half, one fourth, one fourth. In general, things might not work out that cleanly, but let's not worry about that too much. Let's just look at the pattern here. Effectively, what we did is that what we needed was log two of one over p bits per answer. So if answer i had probability pi, we took log two one over pi. For example, here, log two log of one over one half is the two log of two, which is one. Same thing here, the two log of one over one fourth is the two log of four, which is the two log of two to the two, which is two. So as the pattern we see emerging here, that's an encoding scheme you can use in general. If everything were one over two to some power, you could use this. If it's not, you need to do some extra work that we're not going to get into, but the general idea here is that this is a way to decide how many bits to assign to each possible answer. And you can then actually start computing on the average how many bits do you need. You would need sum over i, pi log one over pi bits to encode on the average an answer to a query with a distribution where the probabilities are pi for each answer i. Okay, this is actually called entropy. So this quantity that we just wrote down, which is equal to i equal one through n, pi two log of one over pi, and just a reminder, log of one over x equals minus log x. That's how we go this way. So that's called entropy. Whenever we're given a distribution, we can compute the entropy of that distribution using this equation over here. And that is telling us, on the average, how many bits we need to communicate to answer a question that has an answer distribution given by your distribution. Okay, the one half, one half, Distribution has an entropy of one. The zero one distribution has an entropy of zero. You need no bits. And then here, this one is slightly different distribution ends up having an entropy of half a bit. So the more uniform your distribution, the higher the entropy. The more values you, your uh, answer can take on, also the higher the entropy. The more peak your distribution, the lower the entropy. And what's interesting is that really rare values, even though they might use a lot of bits, because log two of, a, of one over pi for pi really small, means that you would use a lot of bits for a rare answer, but it gets multiplied with pi, because on the average that rare answer will not appear a whole lot, and so the rare answers overall will not use a whole lot of bits on the average. Okay. So now we can look at the concept of information gain. You can look at if you were to make a split in each branch of the resulting tree, what is the entropy of that branch? So you can compute the entropy over here 
The entropy here, H, is zero. Entropy here, H, is zero, because the answer is always the same. And the entropy here is, well, one-third of the time it's one answer, two-thirds of the time the other answer. The entropy would be one-third log one over one-third plus two-thirds log one over two-thirds. On the, hand, on the other hand, the entropy of this one on the right here, this would be um, one, 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 one. They're all uniform distributions, equal probabilities, which is going to is a lot higher than the entropy of the one on the left. So based on entropy, we get here a number that it, this tells us, well, the one on the left is better than the one on the right. Um, you might say, well, it's a little tricky to compare. Can we just, how do we compare? Do we compare the one with this one here, and then this one with this one here, how do we do this? We actually take the average. So you say, on the average, what is my entropy? So in this case here, it's called this H1, H2, H3. The average entropy would be, there are a total of, in this case, 12 examples. Two out of 12, let's write on the top here, two out of 12, Go get entropy H1, plus 4 out of 12 get entropy H2, and then 6 out of 12 get entropy H3. That's our average entropy for this particular split. Over here, we would have 2 out of 12 get, if we call this here, H A, H B, H C, H D, we get 2 out of 12 H A, plus 2 out of 12 HB plus 4 out of 12 HC plus 4 out of 12 HD. So now we have a procedure. If you're asked to split, make a split in your decision tree, you look at all your attributes, you see what happens if you were to split on each of these attributes, then the resulting leaves for the current temporary tree that you have, for each one of them, you compute out the leaves, the entropy, you then average those entropies in a weighted way according to how many examples landed in each leaf, and then you compare the scores, which the entropies of the different, um, the different splits. Okay, so this means we have a full algorithm now. We can pick an attribute, split on it, and keep repeating this build up a decision tree. So in this case, we might end up with first splitting on patrons, which is a nice low entropy. Then over here, we just repeat that procedure. We go through all our attributes that we haven't used yet. Can't use patterns anymore, it's not meaningful because for all these examples, pattern sticks on the same value. We look at all the other, at other at attributes, see what happens in terms of entropy after you make the split. Pick the one that has the best expected entropy. Okay, so here's what you end up with for this particular example. Is this correct? Is this the real pattern that we want to recover? It's hard to say. We just had about, um, in this case, 12 examples. Um, that's not a whole lot of training data. This is learning a reasonably extensive tree. Maybe it's overfitting to the data. It's hard to say. Um, to know things like that, you'd have to do something where you didn't use all your training data. You would leave out some training data that you use for cross-validation. Only, let's say, use 70% of your data, learn a decision tree, and then evaluate on the remaining 30%, see how well you do in that remaining 30, 30%. If you do well on that remainder 30%, that's great, it means you learned a good decision tree. If you do poorly in that remaining 30%, probably means you were overfitting to your training data. Okay, let's do another example, it's a little more complicated, so we can look at some of the issues of overfitting in the context of decision trees. So what we have here is, we want to predict whether a car has a good or bad miles per gallon. We have as attributes the number of cylinders in the engine, um, displacement, horsepower, weight, acceleration, model year, and maker, where maker is just categorized by, con well, continent. Okay, so let's say you look at each of these attributes. You could then check, let's say the first attribute is cylinders that we look at, could take on these values, 
we could look at the resulting distribution over good or bad mileage per gallon for each of these. And we see that, in fact, this one here has a pretty clean uh, distribution, pretty low entropy. There's a lot of blue in one place, in two of them, three of them, and then a lot of red in the remainder one. Um, this one has an information gain. Actually, I should define this. The information gain, which is shown here, is defined as information gain for a attribute, let's say, cylinders, is the entropy you had before you did the split. So H before split minus the average H after split on cylinders. So that's your information gets how much you gain by making that split. In this case, cylinders has a gain of 0 0.5, which is the highest of all attributes. So the first split would be on cylinders. Okay, after you did that split on cylinders, you might now go look at you know, each of these branches in the tree. This one here, 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 and here. And each of them continues independently, right? When you check, well, which attribute to use next, you would use, you would look at all attributes in this particular branch, see which one to pick next. That doesn't mean you also need to use that attribute somewhere else. This branch might split on attribute three, whereas then this one over here might split on some other attribute, right? If we were to run this um, in this one here, we split on maker, uh, where the maker is from, and in this one here, we split on the horsepower. At this point, what are we left with? Um, this one is done, this one is done, this one is done, this one's done, this one's done. Here we still have a distribution, that is, we haven't really distinguished yet between good and bad at the finest level, and then these two are done too. So we have these two left here to make further splits on. Keep doing this, this is what you end up with as your final tree. Okay, so if you now look down here, we see that we still have a distribution. We're left with one good, one bad. If we run our algorithm, and we look at the splits over each remaining attribute, we see that there's nothing you can do. No matter which attribute you split over, they'll take on the same value for both of these training examples, and so you cannot distinguish between them. Essentially, these are two training examples that have the exact same set of attributes, but a different label. So it means you cannot perfectly represent this training data. Okay, so now we've built this entire tree. Um, you might wonder, well, how about overfitting when we work with decision trees? In Naive Bayes, we did smoothing. In Perceptron, we did early stopping. What are we going to do for decision trees? How do we avoid building a tree that's too fine-grained and overfits the training data? For example, if we learned the tree that we just learned and then went to look at some test data, here's what happened. Training set had one error, that one example that we couldn't deal with. The test set has 74 errors out of 352. Percent wrong on the test set is 21%. On the training set, only 2.5%. What that means is that we were overfitting to our training set and now we don't generalize all that well. Um, why is that the case? Well, Look at, for example, this split over here. We have two good ones left, one bad one, and we're splitting into three. Okay. Thanks to that split, we are able to do better on the training data, but think about what's really going on here. You have three training examples. We're gonna split on an attribute that has three possible values. If that attribute were a completely random attribute that randomly takes on values, then it's very likely that splitting on that random attribute will actually help you do well on the training data. It gives you enough, exp if you just have three examples, you can, you can take on three random values for each one of them, likely end up with a split that's as good as this split over here where we get one here and then still a mixture here. 
So the concept I want to get across here is this idea of what were to happen if I generated a feature at random. I had these three training example and I add my random feature, which could take on the values, um, let's say zero, one, and two. And I have my training example one, training example two, training example three. And I assign randomly, maybe it's zero, one, two. Well, in that case, we would split perfectly. But we wouldn't be getting any signal here. This was a random feature. If we had, even in a, some maybe randomly, this one was one, this one was one, this one was zero. Again, we gained something by splitting on the training examples, but this was a random feature. If you look at this process, you'll see that if you have a very small number of examples left, a random feature will likely look like it's improving things. It will improve things on the training data, but it will not actually improve things in terms of generalization. So we need to be careful about whether we're still willing to split. And while we won't get into the specifics of how you compute this, you can do a statistical significance test. You can compute how, how much, what would be my expected information gain if I had a random attribute, compare that with the information gain from your actual attributes, and if the information gain from your actual attribute is not better than the expected information gain from just some random attribute, then you just don't do the split because that means you're going too far. Okay, so you can compute this. We're not getting into the specifics of, specifics of how you do this, but it is important that you understand this concept of if I were to generate a random feature, there will be an expected information gain. That will be non-zero, and I want to compare with that expected information gain that I get from a random feature compared to what I get from my actual feature. Okay, now the way we we do this is you will only split up to a certain threshold, at which point you stop, but even then you might be overfitting. You might still have gone too deep. And of course the real thing we want to do is to check on cross-validation data. How well are we doing on cross-validation data? Now we can think of two ways of, of doing this. As you build your tree, as you go along, you could check on cross-validation data, how well are we doing, and you stop when you stop doing better on the cross-validation data. That's what you would do for Perceptron. But it turns out there's something better we can do. And one way to look at this is, let's say you have the XR function here. Let's say you wanna to learn to represent that function. And let's say that is really the function. You have thousands of training examples, so really it is encoded in your training data that this is the right function. If you look at the root, and think of the two and two as being two million or something, right? Um, based on chance, you're gonna do just as well, if not even better, than you would do based on splitting on any of these features. If you split on the attribute A or attribute B, it doesn't improve things for you. It actually just results in a uniform distribution in both cases, because it's A and not B, or not B, and A and not B, here, so we want to be A and not B gives us one, and then B and not A gives us one. So either one of the features is not allowing to improve our prediction capabilities. But once we look at both features, we are able to improve our prediction capabilities. So what you see happening here is that temporarily here, we do a split that is actually not all that good. In fact, it's not helping, and. It looks like we might be overfitting, but if we then keep going, we do get something good. And so in decision trees, the way the regularization works is you actually keep going all the way till the bottom. This allows you to kind of keep splitting and capture conjunctions between features that only play a role together, but not separately. Then once you're all the way at the bottom, you work your way back up and start pruning. And now if you start from the bottom here and decide, should I prune? you will not decide to prune because actually the last split was really meaningful. You want to keep that. And the only reason you could do that split is because you had earlier splits. So you work all the way to the bottom and then you work your way back up, cutting off branches that are not meaningful. So in this case here, um, we would have, let's see, a training set error 12.50. Percent tested error 15.91, that's a pretty close match. That's where you would stop pruning and you'd be happy with this result. But you wouldn't want to retain the entire 
tree that you had over here. So the pruning all the way back up will reduce your tree to just this tree over here. Okay, so learning theory wise, um, on the horizontal axis, we're looking at um, large trees versus small trees. If you have small trees, you end up with high bias, meaning you're not getting close to the true hypothesis most likely. It's not in your set of small trees. The upside, you have low variance, and that might be good if you have low training data. Um, for large trees, you have low bias, which is nice. You can capture patterns, but then you might have high variance. If you don't have enough training data, you will have a high variance in terms of what tree you get out. It might not be the right one. Overall, somewhere along the way will be the right trade-off, and your held out data is really what you want to look at to decide where you need to be on that horizontal axis. So in summary, we've looked at two ways of regularizing, and then specifically in the context of decision trees, we've kind of looked at it a little more deeply, but one is limiting the hypothesis space, which could be limiting the max depth of the trees. Another way is to um, regularize, meaning try to stay away from the full depth. You don't really restrict yourself from going all the way, but you somehow have a criterion, let's say, compared to chance splits, how good a split is this? And based on that, you'll try to stay away from the bad parts of the space. Neural nets. In some sense, neural nets are one of the oldest techniques in machine learning. They're inspired by the brain. We looked at perceptron, where you saw, well, a perceptron is in some sense inspired by a single neuron, right? Um, but in the brain, there's not just a single neuron. You have many, many neurons. In fact, you have 100 billion neurons in your brain, roughly, on the average. Um, so neural nets kind of are inspired by this idea that maybe if we built something similar to that, some structure similar to that, maybe we can capture something similarly intelligent and then make similarly intelligent predictions. So we're going to be putting together these single neurons, so to say, which are a perceptron, and build a bigger network and see what we can get from that. So as a reminder, what was the perceptron? Pictorially, it looks like this. What's going on here? You have feature values. Those are the inputs that feed into your perceptron. Each feature has a weight associated with it. In a neuron, that would be, in some sense, the conductivity of the channel, how, how big the channel is from that feature into the center nucleus of the neuron. And then the sum of all activations that come in is the total activation. So you have feature values, each multiplied with their own weight, summed together, that's the activation of the neuron. If it reaches a certain threshold, then you would, it would fire and output something positive or negative, depending on what your threshold is. Okay, so that's the math. Um, we have two possible outputs, positive one, negative one. Um, and this is the kind of more computational picture where we have feature one, two, three. Each has their own weight, one, two, three. They get multiplied, summed together, and you have some output that's being thresholded as positive one or negative one. Let's build this into a bigger network. So let's put one in the back here. Let's think about what are we getting here? We're getting some feature values. But as we know, um, features are something we have to hand engineer. Typically, it's hard to come up with the features. So you might wonder, how about learning the features? You could say, why not have a perceptron sitting in front of this perceptron, and that perceptron is learning a feature? So you'd have something that looks like this, where you now have your original features sitting here. And soon enough, we're going to connect this up over there. Um, and this would make a prediction, and we're going to think of this unit as generating a new feature that's learned from the original features, or at least computed at this stage from the original features. There's another one here, another one here. Then we can hook this all up, and now we have a new set of features that are learned, once we learn these weights, from the original features that we feed into our decision-making engine over here, the perceptron at the end. So this one here is still a regular perceptron running a classification. These ones, in many ways, are still regular perceptrons, but they're not used to make a direct prediction. They're used to generate a feature that would be plus one or negative one that's then fed into the actual classifier that's sitting in a later stage. Um, so this is what the total picture looks like now. You have some features coming in all the way on the left. 
they get fed into a bunch of perceptrons sitting in the middle. I'm showing three here, but there could be more than three. There could be hundreds or thousands of these sitting in the middle. And then they all generate their own feature, which is then fed into the perceptron at the very end, which is making a decision. Okay, so our hypothesis here, our hypothesis is something that depends on the weight. So the decision we make for some input f of x depends on the weights here, 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 and here. So even now, originally we only have three features. We actually, in this particular scenario, have 12 weights that need to be learned. Some of the weights are being learned in the first layer over here, and then some are learned in the second layer over here. All right, so how do you learn W? How do you get out a W that does well in this kind of setting here? Think back of what we did for the perceptron, right? For the perceptron, we looked at training examples. If you got a training example wrong, we updated the weight vector to get a better weight vector. Um, here we'll do something slightly different, but quite related. We'll actually define an objective. So we'll go back to something we did in the very first weeks of 188, where we were trying to optimize things using something called hill climbing. We looked there at constraint satisfaction problems and looked at what's the tweak we can apply to our set of assignments to our variables such that we have more constraints satisfied, less constraint violations. Same thing's going to be true here. We're going to look at all our training examples. For each of our training examples, we look at the difference between the label associated with that training example and the prediction our, ne our neural net is making for that training example. That prediction depends on the choice of the weights. For our current choice of weights, we can evaluate this quantity over here, and that tells us how good that set of weights is in terms of fitting our training examples. Then what we can do is we can perturb the weights, make a small perturbation to that weight factor, which in this example here would be 12, we have 12 numbers. We maybe randomly perturb each of these numbers. We can reevaluate how well we do with these perturbed weights, and then we can decide to keep that perturbation if the score were better, or reject the perturbation if the score were worse. Keep repeating. So that's one way, it's not exactly how it's done, but it's pretty close to how it's done. There are slightly more effective methods, but they require a lot more machinery. But it's a reasonable way to think of it this way. You locally perturb the weights, see if it's better on this scoring function. If it is, you keep the perturbation. If not, you reject it. All right. So what are the tricky parts here? Well, it's hill climbing. This is a picture you've seen before. Um, what's nice about hill climbing, you can start wherever. You don't need to know where to start. You just start somewhere. Um, you move to the best neighboring states. If you want to look at multiple perturbations, you can see which one is the best one. Um, what's bad about it is it's not complete. You're not guaranteed to find the best set of weights. Um, and then you find, I mean, you're not able Sorry, let me phrase that again. It's not optimal, you're not guaranteed to find the best set of weights. And when we said in search is not complete, the equivalent here would be that you're not guaranteed to find a set of weights that drives your score to zero where everything is correct. What's particularly tricky in this setting here, the neural net setting, is that um, often when you perturb the weights, nothing will happen. Let's say you make a small perturbation to these weights. Look at this network here. If that nowhere changes something from being below zero and move it above zero, or the other way around, then nothing changes. So locally, things are very flat until you reach a threshold where somehow a weight perturbation will make something flip sign from positive to negative, and then having that happen here is not even enough. It also needs to happen over here, otherwise you don't output a different prediction. So plateaus, really, are the big issue here that you can't really see what the result is of a small, well, you can see what the result is of a small change. It's often, there is no difference. And so you don't know which direction to try things out. Okay, so let's put that explicitly into the picture. We have these threshold units here that are either putting a zero or a one or a minus one or a positive one, depending on how you set it up. How can we resolve this? Instead of just outputting a threshold here, based on a threshold, we can make this smooth. So in the neural net, what you do is you set it up like this. You have this function that looks like that. Instead of something that's zero or one, 
you have something that interpolates between 0 and 1. When you're close to negative infinity, it gets close to 0. When you're close to positive infinity, it's close to 1. And in between, it interpolates between 0 and 1. Now, if you make a small change to a weight, that will directly have some effect on the output of that particular unit, which will then propagate to the next unit. And so any weight change now will reflect in a change in the prediction being made over here at the end. And so now when you do your hill climbing, small changes can be measured in terms of how effective they are, and you can locally improve, and this will work a lot better. In fact, just using this this way will likely not work at all. You, you wouldn't do it that way. You would use, do something that is not just zero one. Okay, here's an interesting theorem about neural nets. Just the neural net we looked at, two-layer neural net. What does that mean? You have input features, then you have your perceptron units, which are now soft, right? Not threshold anymore, but this soft transition. You have many of them sitting here, and then one output unit. These are, sorry. features are connected to each one of those. You have something fully connected like this, it turns out that you can approximate any function of the input. So no matter what function you're trying to learn, a neural net with enough units over here can approximate your actual function within some epsilon where if you get more units, you can make your epsilon smaller. This is a good and a bad thing. The good thing is that means if you use this hypothesis space with a lot of intermediate neurons here, you do end up with a very rich hypothesis space that can fit pretty much anything. The flip side is that now if you have a relatively small amount of training data, then you're likely going to overfit and you need to be careful. So in this case, the cross-validation could happen in multiple ways. One way to do it would be to say, I'm going to learn a two-layer neural net with 10 hidden units, with 20, with 50, with 100, with 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, and so forth. And as a function of the number of hidden units, I'll see my cross-validation error change. As I have more hidden units, probably you'll get less and less error until some point you have too many units, and your cross-validation error will start going up again. And that's where you stop, and that's how you fine-tune your number of units. Okay. This... This process also can actually be repeated multiple times, right? In this case, I just put one hidden layer, but in principle, you could put um, many hidden layers, right? You could put another hidden layer here, another hidden layer, and that way you would learn features that are now functions of features that you learned that are functions of other features that you learned, and you might get more complex expressions there. And then now there are trade-offs too. How many of these Consecutive layers are you willing to consider? How many units in each layer? And that's, again, things you'll have to cross-validate over and see what works best. Okay, so today we looked at um, formalization of learning. So the big idea there was the idea of having, that we have a hypothesis space, a set of things that we might return. And then the training data typically determines which one of those things we return. And at the same time, um, we saw that we need to be careful about picking our hypothesis space. One way to be careful about it is to just keep it small. Another way to be careful about it is to stay away from the outskirts of the hypothesis space. Don't allow weights that are too extreme for the perceptron. Don't allow decision trees that are too large if it's not justified to your cross-validation error and so forth. Then we looked at decision trees. The nice thing about decision trees is that they had a way to encode features that involve multiple of your original features in one feature. Because as you go down a branch in that tree, multiple branchings, you'll see a conjunction of feature one taking on the left branch value, feature two the right branch value, and so forth. If all those things are true, then I'll put this prediction. So you have an end here between features, something you couldn't do with a perceptron the same way. And then the last thing we looked at was neural nets. And these were a generalization of the perceptron. First important change, we would use multiple perceptrons sequenced together. The first layer is considered as a way of generating new features, which then feed into the final perceptron that does your classification. We saw that the way to find the weights, and now there's a lot more weights to be found, could be done by a hill climbing procedure, but we need to be careful about the plateaus that we'd encounter if we just use a perceptron that has a 
zero, one output. So instead of having the zero, one output, we smooth it out using a transfer function that is interpolating between zero and one as you go from minus infinity to plus infinity. This allows you to run a local optimization, a hill climbing procedure to get out something that are pretty good weights in many cases. One thing we also saw for the neural nets is that they are universal function approximators, meaning any smooth function, in this case, could be approximated arbitrarily well as you include more and more units in the hidden layer. It's a good thing if you have a lot of data and you want to be able, you have enough data to justify that. If you don't have enough data to justify that, be careful, make sure to cross-validate and look at different number of hidden units and then cross-validate, see which number of hidden units gives you the best performance in the cross-validation data. That's it for machine learning. Next, we'll look at applications in robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, and games. So that's what's left for us in the next lectures. All right, that's it for today.